Danny O'Connor. I currently serve as the Franklin County Recorder here in Columbus and uh, all of Franklin County. And uh, I'm running for United States Congress in the 12th Congressional District. One thing that folks forget, I think, on the other side of the aisle is that everything that we do from an economic or budgetary standpoint is interconnected. And when we look at a tax cut or, or a tax giveaway, as we just saw, uh, you know, 83% of the tax plan that was voted on by Speaker Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and signed by President Trump goes to the top 1%. It makes tax cuts permanent for corporations. And what that's going to lead to is it's going to lead to a large, large budgetary deficit. And we know what Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell and the President want to do to shore up that deficit. They want to cut Medicare. They want to cut Social Security. They want to cut Medicaid. And, uh, you know, there's a great phrase that is, show me your budget and you show me your priorities. We can pay lip service. Uh, folks can pay lip service to people who clock in and clock out every single day. Folks who work hard, pay into Social Security and expect to get it at the end of their uh, career as a part of their social contract. But unless we're shoring those up and working to protect those, it's nothing but lip service. And when we have a tax cut that is essentially a giveaway to the wealthiest 1%, um, we put ourselves in a position where uh, we have to figure out where that money is going to come from. And I know where I stand. I think we should be spending money on infrastructure, on making sure that our bridges are repaired. I think we should be spending money on making sure that every child has an opportunity to have access to Head Start. I think we should be spending money to make sure that our veterans get the care that they need. I don't think that we need a tax plan that gives 83% of that money to the top 1% and makes tax cuts permanent for corporations. If tax cuts should be permanent for anyone, they should be permanent for middle class Americans, not corporations. Things are going well for some people. We, we have a classic system where we have haves and have nots. And even within this district, there is the wealthiest county in the state of Ohio in Delaware County. And even within Delaware County, there are communities that are suffering. There are communities that are suffering throughout this district. And, uh, you know, we need to have jobs that actually provide a good wage. And, uh, one of the most prime examples of that is the fact that you can go to work. You can put in a 40 hour work week, clock in, clock out, eight hours a day and still live in poverty. And if you put forth the effort and you show up, and you do a good job, you should not live in poverty in this country. So, uh, you know, I, I want our jobs that our folks are able to obtain to be good paying jobs. I think we need to strengthen the opportunity to collectively bargain. I think that a job is a job when it has good benefits. I think that, uh, you know, you, I think we need to see more opportunities for folks uh, to, to narrow that income inequality gap that we've seen over the last 20 years or so. And when we look at the tax plan that was just enacted by Speaker Ryan, uh, we see a tax plan that does not reward people who do things the right way. Look, everybody wants to pay less in taxes. I mean, I want to pay less. You want to pay less. Every single person I meet wants to pay less. But we're all okay, I think, with paying our fair share. The issue is when 83% of a tax cut goes to the wealthiest 1%. Then we're talking about cutting money that can go into our classrooms, that can go to our veterans, that can go to our seniors. And that's where we have a problem. The single most important thing that we can do right now in this country is to protect the Affordable Care Act. And, uh, you know, my mom had breast cancer, and she was diagnosed when I was a freshman in college. And after she was diagnosed, I still remember the weekend, it was mid-October, and I would go home every single weekend after that, my mom is a retired teacher. My mom had access to good health care. She was able to obtain a new drug. She was able to beat cancer, and she's been in remission ever since. What my mom also has right now is what's called a pre-existing condition. And there are millions of other moms and other folks out there who have these pre-existing conditions, whether it's a battle where they beat cancer, whether it's MS, whether it's diabetes. And... Folks who have those conditions should not be left on their own. And if we got, if the other side, if Speaker Ryan is successful 
in getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. That's what we're facing. I think that it is a good thing for young people to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. I think it is a, it is a good thing for folks to be required to obtain coverage because eventually we all are going to get sick. Obviously, the individual mandate was removed in this past uh, congressional session in 2017. We need to bring that back. Obviously, I don't think anyone should be denied coverage if they have a pre-existing condition. So what we need to do is we need to shore up Medicare from a funding standpoint. And that goes back to where is our budget? Are we prioritizing taking care of our seniors? Uh, but we need to defend the Affordable Care Act because um, the wolves are at the gate for it. There is a movement in this country led by Speaker Ryan that wants to gut health care and wants to turn our healthcare system more than it already is into solely a profit mechanism. And it needs to be people over profit. Climate change is real, right? I mean, to deny it is to reject science. I see a, an opportunity with climate change for us to change the way that we do things. Right now, when it comes to renewable energy and the economic driver that it can be, uh, Ohio, Ohio and the United States are behind China, are behind Germany in terms of harnessing the opportunities and possibilities of green technology to be an economic engine. And as our portfolio continues to evolve from an energy standpoint, we need to harness the power of wind. We need to harness the power of solar energy. This needs to be an all all of the above type of uh, endeavor. And if we're going to take care of our planet, it's going to take serious commitment. It's going to take focusing on making sure that we have a portfolio that consists of wind and consists of solar down the line. And that needs to start now. I mean, we saw in the state of Ohio, uh, you know, removal of the energy standards and the energy portfolio. That's hurt Ohio. That's cost Ohioans opportunities. It's cost us, uh, you know, a chance to shore up a tax base. I, I think that we cannot make that same mistake on a national level because if we do, we will continue to fall behind. What's important about energy and what's important about climate isn't what happens in the next five years. It's what happens in the next five decades. And if we continue to miss an opportunity to take a bad situation and turn it into a positive economically, uh, you know, we'll suffer because of that. And, and Ohio and this district especially with vast swaths of farmland is, is well positioned to harness the power of wind, to harness the power of solar, to create jobs, to create a, a strong tax base. And, uh, it's going to take focus and, and, and dedication and a commitment to doing things the right way. I'm proud to have received the designation from Moms Demand Action as a gun sense candidate. Um, I think that that demonstrates my commitment to common sense values. Um, I grew up in rural western Ohio. It was common for us to go out on a Friday night and shoot pop cans with a 22. I mean, no big deal. No one is doing that with an AR-15. No one is hunting deer with assault weapons. These are weapons that are meant to kill. They do not have a place in our society, uh, nor do bump stocks. We do not need to have domestic violence uh, convictor. Uh, people, folks who've been convicted, convicted of domestic violence do not need to obtain a weapon. Uh, folks who are on the no-fly list do not need to obtain a weapon. No one needs a 30-round automatic magazine. If we apply common sense to this issue, we will reduce the number of people who are killed every year by guns. Uh, it's plain and simple. And that has nothing to do with hunting. It has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. It has something to do with whether or not these weapons have a place in our society. And, uh, you know, folks who can't tell a difference between a shotgun that's used for deer hunting and an AR-15 um, should get to know that difference because it's a vast difference. And, and what we're talking about here are weapons that are meant to cause destruction. And those weapons have no place on our streets, they have no place in our society, and they need to be removed from it. I grew up in, you know, very, very red Ohio, redder than anything that we have in this district. And um, when I think back to conversations I had with friends who are Republicans or their parents who are Republicans, um, we're all the same in a lot of ways. We all worry about whether or not we can retire. We all worry about paying the mortgage. We all worry about putting food on the table. And I think that, uh, you know, my message of economic opportunity for all people, 
uh, a message that says, if you clock in and clock out and do things the right way, you should have a shot at getting ahead. I think that's a message that resonates with everyone, no matter what their background is. And I realize that some folks have traditionally voted one way. Folks have traditionally voted another way. Um, I think that our entire political world is being turned on its head right now. I mean, folks are coming out. You know, I had someone at an event I had the other week uh, on uh, last Wednesday who said, you know, I've been a Republican my whole life, and I'm here at your event because, you know, I've read about you. I know the work you've done in the office, in the recorder's office for veterans, for the homeless, and, and you know, I'm voting for you because we need some common sense in Washington, D.C., and I think that's a message that resonates. It doesn't matter if someone's voted Republican, you know, or if someone's voted Democrat all along. I think that we have to have some type of message that actually gives folks a reason to vote. And uh, I think we have that in this campaign. Congress exists as a wholly independent branch of the government from the executive branch. And uh, the entire point of having a Congress in some ways is to pass and legislate bills, but also to provide oversight. And uh, I think that by being the first step in August towards picking up the majority in Congress and making sure that instead of Devin Nunes, we have Adam Schiff on the House Intelligence Committee majority is a positive step. I think that, you know, what Mueller is doing is, is running a full and fair investigation and he needs to have the opportunity to conduct that investigation, and uh, the president should not interfere in that. Uh, you know, the law is the law. The facts are the facts. Um, we're not entitled to our own versions of them. They apply to everyone fairly. And, uh, you know, any attempts to fire him or get in the way or to kind of uh, envelop this situation with a shroud of secrecy that's problematic because our democracy deserves uh, to know what has happened. We have a right to know uh, to what extent the Russians were involved in this process. Um, but in the end, you know, it, it's important for us to focus on making sure that we have, uh, you know, secure elections here at home. It's important to make sure that we're communicating with folks in a fair and honest way. Um, about what we're going to do for them to, to help them get ahead and help them achieve their version of the American dream. And I'm proud to sit on uh, the data board here in Franklin County. And in regards to election security, just a couple weeks ago, we voted to allocate uh, $110,000 to help uh, shore up our election security here at our board of elections. I was proud to vote for that. Um, you know, there are little things that we can do. Obviously, groups like Indivisible and, and folks who are out there uh, you know, telling the truth about some of the things that have been going on, uh, that's just one step forward. I love talking about this issue. We implemented in my office a couple of different things. Uh, we now have paid leave for all of our employees so that none of my employees have to uh, decide between their job and a paycheck and taking care of themselves or a loved one. Um, we've signed the Columbus Commitment for Equal Pay to ensure that all of our employees, no matter uh what their gender are, are paid equally for, for equal work. Um, I think that when we look at um, the front line uh, in terms of women's health care, we see um, organizations such as Planned Parenthood uh, on the front lines there in terms of providing uh, screenings for detecting breast cancer, in terms of providing contraceptive care for women. Uh, my mother, um, you know, when she had breast cancer, I've, I've talked with her about this, you know, when Planned Parenthood has been attacked and attempted to be defunded, um, you know, in a way they're attacking a bunch of folks' moms who don't have the means necessary to get the quality of care that we had. And, you know, we need to strengthen a woman's right to choose. We need to ensure that women are paid equally for the work that they, de that, that they, uh, that they do. And we need to elevate as many women into places of power as we can. I'm, you know, the day after, uh, President Trump's election, uh, you know, that morning I had a breakfast with, you know, a woman who's now my chief of staff for the, the recorder's office. You know, I, I, it was, it was my simple way. I mean, I was planning on hiring her anyway. Um, but it felt at least somewhat like I was pushing back the day after by putting her in a position of power. And, uh, I think that as long as we have that intentionality to make sure that as many voices are present, whether it's the boardrooms, whether it's the halls of Congress, whether 
it's uh, my staff as recorder or someday as congressman that, uh, you know, women's voices are present and that they're paid the way that they deserve to be paid. To me, politics is personal. I spent a year of my life working in the poorest congressional district in the United States uh, through through my faith, through the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. Um, and I was sent to um, this district because I speak Spanish. So my ability to um, speak Spanish uh, allowed me to deal with the exact type of folks who we talk about in these platitudes a lot of the time. When we talk about children who were brought here when they were two years old, I have looked in the faces of those families. When we talk about folks who came here fleeing uh, El Salvadoran death squads, I have worked with folks who fled those death squads. And this country, it, it, it really sickens me. This country was built by immigrants. My last name's O'Connor. We weren't on the Mayflower. We came here fleeing tyranny and the inability to go to mass the inability to celebrate our Catholic faith, the inability to have a country of our own. And we came here because we saw opportunity. And just because we came here 108 years ago, 110 years ago, does not make us any different than the person coming here today. This country has always been about opportunity. And it's been about if you come here and you do things the right way and you work hard, the next generation can have an opportunity. There was a woman who I worked with. I remember the day that she came to talk to me. She was an immigrant from Mexico, and she was undocumented. And she worked two jobs in Midtown Manhattan at two different hotels doing cleaning services. She had two kids who were a sophomore and a senior in uh, high school. The senior was going on to college. The sophomore was taking the PSAT, like the first the practice SAT or whatever that I think everybody took at one point. And I remember talking to her about what she wanted. And I mean, she was facing a situation where her heat was going to be turned off because she had a bad landlord. And but but we got to talking about what she wanted and what she saw in this country and about her kids. And she said something to me that day. She said, I know I don't have a future in this country, but I want my kids to have a future. This is someone who braved everything and lived every single day in a shadow of secrecy, but went to work, who was just trying to do things right for her kids. And when immigration becomes about an acronym or it becomes a political football, I think it takes away a fundamental of who we are as Americans. And that is problematic. It's, it's un-American and we need to protect the folks who do things here the right way. Now, we need to enforce existing immigration laws. If folks are here and are undocumented or illegal and they commit a crime, we should get them out of this country. Um, but there are folks here who have been working and contributing for decades who need a pathway to citizenship, and their children need a pathway to citizenship as well. One thing that's unique about me is I've delivered on my progressive values. As county recorder, we've implemented paid leave. We've come up with creative and groundbreaking programs to help fight homelessness. We've expanded opportunities for the veterans that deal with our office. We've uh, had conversations in many communities about the importance of health care documents. Um, when folks are looking for results, and I think a lot of the voters in this district are looking for someone who's actually delivered results, uh, I think that they'll find in me someone who will get things done for them in Washington. Uh, I'm a reform-minded Democrat. I cleaned up the recorder's office, uh, but did so with less money and implementing more good programs for folks. Um, you know, I think that when we look at this district, we look at the great political debate society that has become Washington, D.C., I think people are tired of that. I think voters know red meat when they hear it. I think voters know pledges and platitudes and pie-in-the-sky ideas when they hear it. I'm someone who has delivered. I'm someone who will always fight for folks. I'm someone who will never compromise when it comes to fighting for people who check in and check out every single day. And it doesn't matter if you're uh, uh, you know, a, a retired coal miner from Zanesville or you work for Nationwide and live in southern Delaware. Uh, I'm going to be the best congressman I can be. I want to give people real representation in Washington because they haven't had that for a long time, and they deserve that here, and the opportunity is too great.